right, hello and welcome to the first episode of Are You a Good Bitch or a Bad Bitch? My name is Ari. I am the creator of this podcast. I am a Taurus. I am a witch. And I love cats and One Direction. And this is my co-host. Hi, I'm Katie. I'm a Capricorn, a biologist, also love cats in One Direction, and I bake a lot. Uh, we have been friends for many years, so. Like seven. Going strong. Really? Yeah. Has it been seven? Yeah. I don't know math, so. Yeah, seven years. <laughs> Thirteen? Uh-huh. Okay. Nice. Right? Ah. So, we're here to take a look at really awesome, but also really awful, <laughs> women throughout history. So I actually had this idea, this podcast, because I have this book. It's called Bad Girls Throughout History by Anne Shen. She kind of does a little, like, blurb about each woman, but it's mostly for her art. Um, and I was like, oh my god, like, I've never even heard of half the women in this book. And I was like, we should learn more about badass women through history. And then I was like, badass women, like, women that did bad things. <laughs> so I was like, we should explore both. And I couldn't think of a better co-host than with Katie. Katie Hill. Well, thank you. I um, probably am one of your most obnoxious and loud feminist friends. Um, and I'm also your nerdiest. I love learning. And what better thing to learn about than women are history glasses glazed over. So each week we'll pick one woman from roughly the same time period and take a look at what they did, for better or for worse, to affect the world around them. Hopefully, we'll see some neat similarities, probably a lot of differences, and we'll definitely learn a lot of interesting things that we didn't know before. Yeah, so we'll do one good bitch and one bad bitch, um, and we're going to alternate between who gets the good and who gets the bad of the week. Right. Katie <laughs> wants to do some bad, and I want to do some good, so yes. Um, but I'm really excited to start learning about all these women and all their accomplishments or, you know, not accomplishments yeah before we jump in we should talk about what was going on with women in the time period that we chose so for this week uh we're doing the late 1600s early 1700s oh so early 1700s that's actually right around 1692 which is around the salem witch trials which i know a lot of because i am a salem tour guide <laughs> Um, and women, um, yeah, were not treated great, actually. <laughs> yeah, we know that, um, witchcraft was more an attack on women than actual witch hunting. Um, and the fear of witchcraft, which I'm sure you know, being a Salem tour guide, was a fear that was much more widespread than just Salem. Um, and one of the claims was that women were more susceptible to occult powers because they were the weaker sex. Hmm. Um, <laughs> yeah. Beyond witchcraft, though, uh, women were often left to the whims of men in this time. Um, not that we can relate now at all. <laughs> um, so male heads of households determined whether the women could work or if they were expected to stay home and tend to the house. Um, class obviously played a huge role in this, but many women were well educated as far as medicinal herbs and needlework went because... That's what you needed to run a household back then. Yes. And they were also expected to stay quiet, polite, delicate, and have as many children as possible due to the very high infant mortality rate. Um, and if you were too loud or outspoken, there was risk of being punished, whether at home or by being sent away, or even maybe sent to an asylum or something, you know, locked up. Or... In Salem cases, you were hanged. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I can tell you there's many, a lot of the women during the witch trials, that was the issue exactly, that the they were too outspoken, mm -hmm. um, which was not okay at this time. Yeah. Um, yeah, you're right. Like you said, like men would tell women what to do at this point. Mm -hmm. The dads controlled you, and if the dads didn't control you, then the husbands did. Right. And that's the way it always was, and, you know, I mean, as we can see now, the way it always was is an excuse to continue doing it for much longer than anyone should. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, on that note, <laughs> we should jump into our first woman of the week, and we're going to, again, always start with the good, because um, ladies first, I guess. I guess. I guess they're, they're both, both ladies, ladies. but... <laughs> 
<laughs> I'll go first. I have the first, the first good bitch. So I'm going to talk to you this week about Lady Mary Wortley Montague. She was born in May 1689 in Nottingham, England, as Mary Pierpont. She was born to a very well-off family. Her father was a duke, and from very early on, she planned on being great. In one of her early diaries, she wrote, I am going to write a history so uncommon. There is a a long-running theme of her wanting to achieve the impossible and go beyond what women could do at the time. Um, She had wanted to run to the horizon and catch the falling sun. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Obviously, she quickly realized that that was impossible, but (laughs) she still held herself to high standards. Um, Unfortunately for her, her mother died when she was pretty young. And um, she believes that her mother would have supported her, but she was instead raised by her father's mother until she was eight, and she died. Oh. And then her dad raised her. Um, unfortunately, dads in this time period weren't always known for being the best. Um, he didn't really feel that their education was his responsibility, and so Mary and her siblings were taught by a governess. What's a gov? Is that different than a nanny? Um, I think it's kind of an all-encompassing, like nanny and educator, like a an, an all-purpose caregiver oh, okay. um, for rich kids. Okay, yeah. Um, <laughs> the governess. So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so, the governess gave Mary an education that Mary did not care for. Um, she said that she was only taught superstitions and old wives' tales. So Mary took it upon herself to supplement her education with her family's extensive library. Um, She taught herself Latin, which at the time was reserved for men. Um, But by the time she was 13, she was as good as most men. Good for her. Um, Latin's hard. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) uh, I'm a biologist, so I should have taken Latin because, you know, a lot of our words. Yeah, um, I didn't, though. Uh, I was not great with other languages. I didn't take any languages. I I regret it. I took French and Italian and can say eggplant in Italian and can... I have mild conversational French skills. (laughs) Um, So when we cover a French girl, you'd be like, yeah, I'm on it. (laughs) Oui. (laughs) (laughs) But um, by the age of 15, Mary had written... Two albums of poems and songs, one short novel, and a prose and verse romance. At 15? Mm-hmm. Holy um, pretty man. sure at 15 I was obsessed with the Jonas Brothers and uh, wrote the essays I was required in school. What was I doing at 15? That was, what, 2010? Right, that's math? Uh, that's math. 2011? <laughs> Something like that. Um, what was I doing at 15? Uh, I was, um, you know what? I was doing so many sports. <laughs> I was such a sport, sporty kid. Uh, that's probably what I was doing. So she also corresponded with bishops who supplemented the governess's learning um, and teaching. Um, she also wrote letters to her friend Anne. Um, she met Anne when she was about 19. And Anne had a brother. Um, this brother was Edward Wortley Montague. So she wrote and saw Anne a lot until Anne's untimely death, and then she started writing to Edward. She did this without her father's permission, which was a bold move for a woman of the time. How dare she? Yeah. yeah. Um, And when her father did find out, he was not pleased. Um, At some point, her father moved her family from Nottingham to Acton, which Mary hated because this new house didn't have a library and was also away from what she knew. Um, and I'm sure it didn't help that shortly after she moved, she caught the measles. <laughs> oh, good. Mm-hmm. Which she obviously survived, but during her time with the measles, she looked rough. 
Um, obviously, measles gives you all the red marks and all splotches. And, yeah. I'm glad we don't get the measles anymore. Thank you, vaccines. Please mm-hmm. vaccinate your children. Yes, please. Please <laughs> do. Um, Not that we're telling you what to do. But. No, I am. I am absolutely telling you to vaccinate your She's children. She's a biologist, so listen. Um, <laughs> So she continued to write to Edward during this time, and Edward actually didn't care that she had the measles. Uh, He said something along the lines of, well, if you're ugly, there'll be less men after you, so I'll have a better chance. Uh, That's... uh, (laughs) Yeah, not exactly the um, compliment or something that I would like to get in a letter. Um, I believe Mary also expressed some distaste with it. She's like, oh... Thanks. Yeah. Um, so, as I mentioned, her father wasn't thrilled about Edward, and he made him a proposition for marriage, which would be a lot of money, and Edward was like, mm, I don't have that. So, her dad tried to find her another so wait, suitor. He was like, you can marry my daughter if you pay for her? Sort of, yeah. It was um kind of like a, I need to make sure that you're going to be able to take care of her, because men were expected to take care of their wives since women couldn't do anything without their father or husband's permission. Also sounds a little bit like, give me your money, but... (laughs) Well, I mean, yeah. (laughs) I I mean, daughters are one of their greatest, um, I don't want to say cattle, but basically cattle. What does that say? Is it by the cow? We get the milk for free kind of thing. I, yeah. <laughs> I hate <that. laughs> Um, So her dad found her another suitor that did have quite a bit of money. Um, and I actually wrote down this guy's name because I couldn't believe that it was a real name. Um, so he tried to set Mary up with a man named Clotworthy Skeffington. Clot as in blood clot. (laughs) Clotworthy Skeffington. There's a horrible name. Uh Uh Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, I'm really glad that Clotworthy is not a name that (laughs) carried on to this time. Uh, (laughs) um, Oh, Clotworthy. Why would you even end in worthy? That was a weird... I mean... Clot, too. (laughs) Did you go by Why would you pick... I I have no... I don't want to think of nicknames for this name. I... Wert. Bad. Bad. (laughs) But Mary wasn't thrilled about it. Um, whether that had a lot to do with the name or not, we'll never know. <laughs> I but I think it did. <laughs> She's like, excuse me? <laughs> so she ended up eloping with Edward. Um, not because she loved him, but because it was her choice. So she decided to elope with Edward instead. Good for her. She ran off Even and kind of was it like... wasn't because of love, but it was her choice. Yeah. So she eloped with him. At that point, you kind of, you needed a husband to kind of do anything. Right. Um, And it was helpful to have someone well off. And while Edward wasn't as rich as Clotworthy, um, (laughs) he was in um, the government and he was rising in politics. So they had a son and he was in politics and she was gorgeous and witty and the court loved her. She was a big hit in the court. Eventually, um, they had moved to London, and she got smallpox. She got the measles. Now she's getting the smallpox. Yeah, and smallpox was a huge problem of that time. Um, You know, way before, obviously, it's not an issue now because we had a vaccine and we've, you know, wiped it out. Again, thanks, vaccines. (laughs) Um, But she obviously survived, but it would take... One in four people that were affected by it. Wow. Mm -hmm. Um, In fact, she lost her brother to smallpox. Oh. So this was a big issue for her. I mentioned that she was very gorgeous. Well, smallpox ruined that for her. It scarred up her face. It caused a lot of issues. Um, But nonetheless, she carried on because... She What else are you going to do? Exactly. You're ugly now. Go (laughs) hide in a bush. So she got smallpox and survived, and then her husband was assigned ambassador in Constantinople, and breaking with traditions, she chose to go and travel with him. So she and her son went with her husband to Constantinople. So while she was in the Ottoman Empire, she was able to see the details and places in this world that men weren't allowed. 
because of her class and, she, you know, being a woman. So she, there had been a lot of letters and descriptions of this world written by men that she was able to challenge. Um, she was able to give better details of the dress and the traditions and the do's and don'ts of, you know, the society of women. She became friends and learned Turkish customs and was welcomed into the world of women. She wrote letters to her sister and people back home, um, which were later published. You will perhaps be surprised at an account so different from what you have been entertained with by the common voyage writers, who are fond of speaking of what they don't know. And trite observations, superficial of boys, who only remember where they met with the best wine or the prettiest women. One of the things that she had a lot to say about were the bathhouses. Ooh, uh, bathhouses. Um, yes. <laughs> she contested the claim that they were spaces for, as some males said, unnatural sex practices. Was it all women bathhouses? Yes. Um, oh, this is yes, my type there, of bathhouse. <laughs> <laughs> there were some writings that basically said that if you found a man there, the punishment would be unbelievably severe. Yes. <laughs> Um, she kind of called them women's coffee houses. Basically, they were a space for women to speak freely about social and political events oh, free you mean from the being man able lie. to talk without a man. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, so they were so interesting because women would hang out in them for hours, all while completely naked. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> um, in fact, she arrived at the bathhouse one time in like her full riding gear, and instead of being ashamed at their own nakedness, they laughed at her, and they were like, "What are you doing wearing that? <laughs> Just take your clothes um, off, girl. We're naked." Well, this they, sounds. And the more you describe it, I'm like, "I belong." Um, well, <laughs> these baths. They were also so confused when they saw her corset. Um, they assumed it was a contraption that her husband made her wear, because I why mean, would you keep that it, on though? when you could be naked with us? Yeah. I mean, that's literally the reason I stopped wearing a bra. Yeah. <laughs> one day I was like, oh my God, I can't wait to get home and take off the bra. And I said to myself, is that the one reason I want to go home right now is to take off this bra? And then I was like, yeah, because it's so uncomfortable. And I was like, wait a minute, what if I just stopped wearing the bra yeah and it literally changed my life i have more bra for you've years. definitely been a much happier person since then thank you <laughs> i was like woo they're yeah. free um but yes so these bathhouses were a haven for women as opposed to whatever the the Why males around anymore would make them out to be um it's possible or yeah because they're this is in constantinople right yeah this, this was um in the early 1700s Okay. So you probably can't find that specific bathhouse. Okay. So she wrote all about all of her experiences here. Um, again, a lot of this was due to her class that she was able to gain access to this. But one thing that she acknowledged that was very interesting in the bathhouses is when everyone was naked, class was indistinguishable. Oh. Right. Because obviously when we're all naked, we're down to our bare minimum mm, yeah. and... There's no jewels and hair, and it's just you and your skin. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, when you break it down, mm -hmm. and you don't know. That's kind of nice. Yes, so her writings were later in life praised by many people, including um, Voltaire and Alexander Pope, who was considered a, is, is considered one of the greatest poets of the time. Never heard of him, but um, <laughs> must not he, have been that grammar. <laughs> or I just didn't pay attention in English class. She, <laughs> <laughs> she was also criticized by many, um, including printing presses, many prominent male figures, and Alexander Pope. So <laughs> there's this brilliant painting by William Powell Frith. Um, that shows Mary absolutely joyous. She's like in the middle of laughing and Alexander Pope is on a chair hunched over and he's pissed. Well, come Can to I find see this out. Picture? Yes. <laughs> come to find out. Oh, it's a painting? Yes. Um, at some point early on in their relationship in Pope and Mary's, they would write back and forth and it was clear from his letters to her that he thought she was witty and charming and fantastic. And he was basically like, listen, I am in love with you. She <laughs> laughed in response. <laughs> ha! 
She was not into him, at least not the same way, and from there his opinion of her turned, because much like men now, um, very often they're like, hey babe, I love you, and you're like, sorry, I'm not interested, and he's like, what makes you think I'm interested in you? But this is the painting. We will share this on Instagram, I... um, so that you all can her enjoy face this. Is- fantastic <laughs> um i didn't Just get a time so but good. it's painted by william powell frith he's so <laughs> yeah his his eyes are just haunted he's just like i can't believe i confessed my love to this woman and she just shot me down this is like that's a good one <laughs> this is fantastic yes oh my god i love that beyond her writings uh one of the coolest things that mary did that Um, I don't think she's nearly as famous for as she should be. Um, I mentioned that Mary had smallpox. She lost her brother to smallpox. Obviously, it was a huge problem for the time. Mm -hmm. Um, There were Ottoman women, older Ottoman women, who had segregated houses called zananas. Zananas. And I hope I'm saying, I've only ever read the word, so it could be pronounced wrong and I'm butchering it. Interesting name. Right. But... She was able to go there and witness um, what they called engrafting, and we now know as inoculation. What is ig- igno? How do you say it? Inoculation. Inoculation. How? What is, what um, is that? So it's gross, <laughs> um, but it's basically pre-vaccine. So um, Montague, how she described it. Um, There is a set of old women here who make it their business to perform the operation every autumn. When the great heat is abated, thousands undergo this operation, and there is not one example of anyone that has died in it. Basically, what the women do, they they would take a small amount of pus from a mild smallpox blister. Okay, starting off gross. Mm -hmm. Um, They would take enough to fit on the head of a needle. And then they would ask you, arm or leg? And they would make a scratch, and they would put the pus in the scratch. Uh, <laughs> right. So people that went through this often developed a very mild case of smallpox, which was enough to allow their bodies to make antibodies. Okay. So it's basically so, like the first. Yes, it's the first very unsafe, very not recommended, very gross form of vaccine. <laughs> If that's what you um, but, went to the doctors today, I mean, all right, we're just going to scratch, scratch. It's kind of a similar idea of, um, I know when we were little, it was kind of a thing where some parents would um, have chicken pox play dates. Yes. Yes. Um, I do remember that. To kind of like get it out of the way. Um, but in this case, it was, we're going to give you a very mild case so that if an ep- epidemic hits, you don't have to die. <laughs> Good. Good. Right. Because that's how it should work. Um, And she thought this practice was incredible. She had her almost five-year-old son inoculated the next year, and he had absolutely no no issues with it. Nice. Um, When they were back in London, she had her three-year-old daughter inoculated publicly as well, um, as she had been met with disdain when promoting the treatment because... An untrained female aristocrat thought she should give advice to male physicians that she learned from the Islamic people. Ugh. Right. So they managed to hit all of the, the sexist, the classist, the racist, the racist all, of the, it. all that good stuff. Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because, you know, why not? What do you expect from white British men in ugly wigs? That's all I gotta say. Um, <laughs> actually, exactly this. This is exactly what I expect from them. Yeah. Yeah, true. <laughs> Obviously, a lot of people were like, mm, I don't know about this. But when they saw that her daughter re- reacted well, her son had reacted well, um, many of the higher class families decided to get it done for their children. The Princess of Wales also had it done. She was not King George I's daughter. She was the in-law. Okay. So she begged him to let her kids get inoculated. And he demanded more tests first. So, they tested six inmates who were offered release if they allowed themselves to be tested on. And it worked. Um, They also tested on several abandoned children, some orphans. Oh. Because, you know, what are you going to do with a couple of orphans if not use them as test subjects? Yeah, right? They're just orphans. (laughs) Yeah. Um, 
And again, this is no- why Batman becoming Batman. <laughs> Um, and again, no issues. So the Princess of Wales asked again. However, the king didn't want to risk his male heirs, mm. so only the daughters of Princess Caroline were allowed to be inoculated. I don't see where this is going. Um, yeah, I, I didn't find out if, I didn't look into see if any of the male oh. heirs had caught it. I was really hoping that was where that was going. <laughs> and then but, all of his sons died. <laughs> but all of the females were inoculated and... Never had an issue with it. So, between Princess Caroline advocating for inoculations and Lady Mary publishing anonymous articles in support of it, um, many other royal families and wealthy families followed Montague's lead, including Catherine the Great of Russia. Um, Who is someone we'll definitely have to cover later on. Oh, yeah. For sure. Oh, yeah. Um, And this idea this process kind of continued until edward jenner eventually um created the smallpox vaccine so edward jenner is um someone that i learned about in many of my intro to bio courses and immunology he's the father of vaccines yeah even though you know it was around from women from other countries you know but he (laughs) yeah he did make it much safer um he used cowpox which is the less virulent version of smallpox and he probably found out the whole scientific way it worked right whereas i think a lot of people are like it it works not sure why but it works (laughs) yes but it is very frustrating that I learned all about Edward Jenner and didn't learn about Mary until we decided to do this podcast. I mean, even, it was even like a thing before a white rich woman came out and was like, it's a thing. Right, yes. It It started. It it had to be from, you know, another country. Yes, I'm not sure the exact initial origins, but yes, this rich white woman found out from the Ottoman woman, the elderly Ottoman woman who, you know, we... (laughs) We don't like women, but we especially don't like old women. Yeah. Um. So, she is thought to be the big reason that inoculations became popular in Europe, which, again, stopped so many deaths from smallpox. Um, Later in life... Mary basically dipped on her husband after the kids had left the nest. (laughs) She was like, okay, the kids are old Um, enough. As I mentioned, she didn't marry Edward for love, and they kind of grew estranged, and she chose to travel and take lovers and eventually self-exiled herself in Italy. Okay, yes, bitch. Until he died. Um, (laughs) She kept in contact with her daughter and wrote her letters about travel, philosophy, literature, And what I thought was the greatest, the education of girls. She wanted to make sure that her granddaughter was educated. Oh. She had said at one point that reading was the cheapest and most exciting source of entertainment, something along those lines. It is. Right. Um, And she thought it was very important for her... She educated her daughter. She wanted all of her future offspring, whether male or female to be educated and to learn yeah right i respect that she eventually was diagnosed with cancer um in 1762 she ended up going home to be surrounded by her daughter and family um until she died at age 73 um she lived a pretty good life yeah she she lived a pretty long pretty good life and Obviously, feminism has evolved and grown and changed, and I would not consider her a perfect feminist. Again, she had many privileges. She had made talk to her daughter and kind of made sure that her daughter married someone rich because, you know, the issues of being poor in that time especially were pretty astronomical. It's almost a survival Um, thing. Yes, yes. But all in all, she was much more advanced in her feminism than most people at that time were. Mm -hmm. Um, And she used her influence for good, you know, with inoculations and education. And I'm going to go ahead and say that she was a good bitch. I think she was a good bitch. I mean, everything you said, she sounded like a good bitch. Yeah, she, um, I couldn't find anything 
in particular that I was like, ooh, no. <laughs> like, maybe, maybe not. But no, she sounded great. I mean, like, like you said, like, without her, I feel like, you know, the thought of getting some type of vaccine, even though it wasn't a vaccine yet. Right. I mean, even now, there are the anti-vaxxers. Ugh. So, especially back then when... You know, diseases were still caused by humors, and people didn't really know the science behind She's things. She's hysterical. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was a... <laughs> Which also, unrelated, another fantastic podcast, Hysteria. Highly recommend. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> um, yeah, she was a good bitch. Yeah. I liked her. And never heard of her. Nope. Nope. Not even as a biologist, not even in any of my English classes... Didn't know who she was until you suggested this podcast. She's both a beautiful, like, kind of scientist and also, like, beautiful poet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Best of both worlds. Yeah. All right. Well, I liked that. And, yes, um, thank you. I, I will pass the torch to you so we can learn about our first bad bitch. So, last night I watched both, actually, all three Pirates of the Caribbean <laughs> to get me psyched. And ready for this story. <laughs> I I mean, I also, what better way to get prepared for a pirate? Yeah, I also, re- again, like, um, reestablish my bisexuality. Um, <laughs> because Kira Knightley, mm, just... She's gorgeous. And Johnny Depp? Orlando Bloom? Mm. Oh, Very mm. piratey men. Yep. Yes, thank you. Mm. My lady, obviously, is a pirate. Um, her name is Anne Bonny. So we're going to get into this. So I just want to make a little quick... Thing. Everything we know about Anne Bonny comes straight from this book. Um, his name was Captain Charles Johnson. The book was called A General History of Pirates. Um, for some reason, he spelled pirates with a Y. Hmm. So pirates. Okay. <laughs> Whatever floats his boat. <laughs> um, it was released in 1724, which is just like literally like three years later uh, from all of her escapades. Okay. Um but this is, like, everything we know of her. So a lot of it's, like, allegedly. Right. You know, so. <laughs> but, so here we're going to, we're going to jump right into it. So Anne, originally uh, born as Anne McCormick in 1700 in Cork, Ireland. She was uh, the illegitimate daughter of a well-known lawyer of his time, William McCormick, and his servant lady. Good. Good, Good. start. Yep. <laughs> so... Obviously, the servant couldn't hide that she was pregnant, and the wife soon found out. Mm-hmm. Um, and she made his adultery so public and so shameful that he had to skip town, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Him and his wife, or not sorry, the mistress, not the wife, uh, and Anne, they all moved to London. Now, they were only in London for a little while. Nice of him to take his mistress, though, you know, I yeah, guess. I mean, he's like, yeah, he was like, okay, I knocked you up. I guess I'll take care of you. <laughs> and so they went to London. He started to, um, oh, he, I think he opened a new practice to, for, to study law. Or mm-hmm. not, he's already a law, but you know. Right. right. Um, and he started dressing Anne as a boy and calling her Andy. Why did he do that? Um, because, <laughs> why did he do that? <laughs> uh, well, so boys were treated a little bit nicer than the young girls. Yeah, fair um, enough. <laughs> they could probably run around without, you know, anything happening to them. And also, I think eventually he wanted to teach her about the law so that he could, like, pass the business on to her. And at the time, you couldn't really do that to women, so you could do it to his quote-unquote son, okay. Andy. Um, but, once again, his wife learned about what they were doing in London. Um, and she exposed them in London. <laughs> <laughs> his law practice failed. So uh, they had to completely <laughs> leave the country. They had to go overseas. I gotta be honest, that is the level of petty I aspire to achieve. <laughs> I just... So they had to leave. They went all the way to uh, Americas. To the Americas. They went to South Carolina, um, to Charlestown. He dropped the Mick and McCormick to sound less Irish. And also so that she couldn't find him again. <laughs> I think that's the real reason why. Um, so by the time they got here, Anne's mother, unfortunately, she passed when she was only like 12 years old. Um, so really her dad was like 
the caregiver. And he tried to establish himself as an attorney again. It just wasn't happening in America. So instead, he found business in merchants. And he actually started a business with that and grew really good. He became wealthy and powerful. He had a lot of connections. And soon enough, he was able to purchase a whole plantation. Wow. Yeah. So That's he, impressive. He actually made it pretty good in, in, in America. So he wanted to give Anne, like, a good education. Except Anne was not a good child. She was <laughs> a horrible child. <laughs> she hated education. She hated uh, reading and going to school. She got into a lot of fights with other kids um, and she had a really bad nasty temper. There was a few different rumors of her nasty temper. Uh, one of them being that she stabbed a servant girl oh. with a knife Oh, when she was uh, 13 years old. Oh, I don't know how old your servant girl was though. Does it matter? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's also rumored that she beat this man half to death because he tried to rape her. So I okay. mean... Okay. So anger issues come in handy once in a while. Good to know. <laughs> but lucky for her dad, Anne was very beautiful. She was considered a catch, especially because she had very long and beautiful red hair. Um, so he continuously tried to marry her off and basically sell her. So, Yeah, that yep. sounds about right. Um, instead of marrying any of the men... That her father wanted her to marry. Instead, she started to peruse around local taverns and was supposedly was sleeping with fishermen and drunks. Um, now, there's a quote from the book I mentioned earlier, The General History of Pirates, mm -hmm. where he said, and I quote, She was not altogether so reserved in the point of chastity. All right. That's a very nice way to say that she's she around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then in 1718, she met this poor sailor slash privateer slash part-time pirate, James Bonney. Now, her dad did not want to marry her to marry this man. She was like, he's a loser. He's he's not going anywhere. Right. Don't do it. Yeah, don't marry this guy. Yeah, similar to mine. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but she was like, I don't care. And she eloped with him. And that's where she gets her last name is from this man. Oh. But it is said that um, Bonnie, that James Bonnie probably only married her for the dad's money to, in the first place. But as soon as that they got married, the father actually just completely disowned and removing her from the will. Well, that's unfortunate. That's yep. a backfired plan. And not soon after that, they got married, and then they found out that Anne uh, wasn't on the will anymore. Um, the plantation her father owned just mysteriously caught on fire. Uh-huh. It's coincidence. It's just a coincidence. There's no evidence saying what happened. It was... Whose fault is it? We don't know. Plantations sometimes just, just catch on out. fire. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, so with nowhere to go, because she was kicked out of the plantation that they burned down. I mean, not <laughs> supposedly. <laughs> Allegedly. And, yeah. <laughs> um, Anne and her newlywed husband moved to Nassau in New Providence in the Bahamas. Um, no, so apparently New Providence was kind of like a safe haven for pirates. So much so that it was actually nicknamed the Republic of Pirates. Cool. So this is where Anne really started to be really intrigued with pirates and started mingling with them. However, her husband was leaning more towards privateering. What's the difference? All right. <laughs> so the difference is basically if you're a pirate, that's illegal. You're not allowed to do it. But if you're basically doing the same exact thing, privateering, you're looting the ships, especially merchant ships, but you're doing it under King, I think it's King George at this point. King oh, okay, One of yeah. the King Georges. I know for... My my girl, it was King George the First. So since they're roughly the same the name, time, yes. probably King George the First. Yeah, I think if he said it was okay, then it was legal form of gotcha. Pirate. So basically, um, if pirates um, overtook, let's say, like Spanish ships, uh, Asian ships, like any other ship that wasn't British, they didn't care. They didn't give a fuck. Okay. Um, because that's what privateerings were doing. Right. But as soon as pirates started taking any type of British ships, any American ships, then... Then it was an was issue. Problem. Right. Yes. Okay. So that's the difference between privateering and pirating. Not much. So which is why a lot of 
higher it started out as privateering and a lot of them usually teetered back and forth um right some of the like you know what the king doesn't know won't hurt him kind of thing yeah all right and a lot of times if you were pirating and you did kind of became quote unquote too powerful then that's when they would kind of start hunting you down which brings me to okay. this james bonnie not only was he be more privateering he actually became an informant to the governor where he would tell the governor about local pirates in the area which would lead to their arrests and eventual hanging basically aka he was a snitch snitches get stitches yeah <laughs> so Anne hated that oh fun fact the governor who he was reporting to uh was governor woods roger okay he was a former pirate himself <laughs> which is how these things usually worked and he composed a most wanted list of notorious pirates wow. including blackbeard oh i know that guy yeah now i originally thought that blackbeard was hanged in salem but i did a little bit more research and apparently he was in like a huge battle um down in the carolinas or virginia around there mm -hmm. where he was killed in battle and his head was on a stake where it stayed on the stake for a while until it basically became a skull. Right, gross. Um, and then the skull mysteriously disappeared. Oh. Until it randomly popped back up as a goblet. It was like, <laughs> the inside was painted with like silver. It was like decked out. And now it's in the Peabody Essex Museum. Neat. I mean, yeah. if I found a famous pirate skull, the only option is, is a DIY goblet. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, think how fucking badass like, that is. you know, some, some metallic, non-toxic paint, a really nice stem. Ugh, it would oh, this be This is what I'm picturing. Like, think of, like, me as, like, almost like Cersei Lannister, <laughs> right? In that type of dress, holding my goblet, which is also a pirate skull, full of the thickest, beautiful red wine ever. Which is absolutely a Cersei. That, that, is, that is Cersei's mood. Yeah. So that's what I'm picturing. <laughs> Also, fun fact, when I was about 10 or 11 years old, I was in a play called Jolly, Jolly Roger, and I played a pirate named Bluebeard. I would probably pay money to see that play. Um, so I had to have a blue beard, obviously, um, but the beard that they gave me was like super itchy. So instead of wearing the fake beard, I... Oh, no. I drew on a beard with blue Sharpie. Oh, my God. <laughs> and I do have a picture of this. Which will also be posted on our Instagram. Here you go. Again. Jesus Christ, that's magnificent. It is you. I... That is the best blue Sharpie beard that I have ever seen. Thank you. Did I really myself. hope this play was on a weekend so that it had time it to wash off before school. <laughs> I was so weird in school, though. Like, if I did come in with a blue beard, people would be like, that's... That's sorry. That's about right. <laughs> it was a great play, and all I had to do was, like, sip out of a coconut, and I was, like, lazy, and I was sitting on top of gold, and I was like, this is the life. I was like, we got it made here, kids. I'm pretty sure that would be you as a pirate, yeah. including the drawn-on Sharpie beard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, anyways, where was I? Um, Where... Here we go. All right. So Anne didn't like that her her husband was a pirate snitch because that's what he was. So instead, she become very infatuated with one particular pirate man. Um, uh -oh. And she fell in love with him. And his name was John Calico Jack Rackman. Now, that name sounds familiar. Well, apparently he wouldn't have been as popular as a pirate captain if it wasn't for Anne. So you, but that makes sense because I've also heard the name Anne Bonnie. Bonnie. Yeah. We're just going to call him Captain Jack. <laughs> Love it. Because his whole name is very long. So it's Captain Jack. So she wanted to run away with him. Um, but Jack actually was like, you know what? I'll be, you know, I'll be the man here. And I'll offer to buy you from your husband. Oh, that's so kind of him. Yeah, right? What a gentleman. I, I long for the day that some man offers to, to buy, buy me. me. <laughs> I'm, I'll ask JP Nick when he gets here how much. Un unsurprisingly, um, James Bonney was like, no. <laughs> and then he's like, okay, well, I'll beat, I'll beat you up. And then he was like, fucking bring it on. I actually don't know what happened. <laughs> 
<laughs> but um, we're basically they left together because Anne was like, "Fuck it, I, I'm, I'm leaving you, James." So they she left him in August 1720, and this is where Anne started her pirating escapade. All right, let's get into it. All right, so they started with stealing a ship. Obviously, that's how you start all pirating. Yeah. Um, they start they stole a sloop. Ooh, and the sloop. Whether they named it or the, it already had this name, um, but the ship was named the Revenge. That is perfect. And they gathered a crew and sailed the seven seas. Now, Anne dresses like a boy, but I think most of her crewmates knew she was a woman. So I think it was very progressive, you could say, because having a woman on board a ship was very bad luck. I think they even mentioned that in Pirates of the Caribbean. Yeah, they do. It's like the first thing they mention. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So it was very uncommon for this to happen. But they started doing piratey shift stuff, you know, started taking over ship, plundering, stealing, drinking beer, singing yo-ho-ho in a bottle of rum. Uh You know, all the good stuff. Yeah, Yeah. the the typical pirate antics. Arg, arg. Exactly. Yeah. They may have even had a parrot or two. Oh, I wish. (laughs) (laughs) She, Anne was so... (laughs) Piratey? <laughs> I don't know how to describe it, but she, she fought, she drank, she swore like a badass pirate. She was very respected by her crewmates because she was just like, she was very intense. That's she was just was. one of the boys. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> um, one legend says that she actually silenced a despairing shipmate by stabbing him in the heart. She has a thing for stabbing. A thing, yeah. Allegedly. Allegedly. <laughs> and now there's two different things here with Anne. Now it is said that she, she did always dress like a man no matter what. She rarely wore women's clothes. Um, I imagine that the giant hoop skirts would get in the yeah, way and, of a and, pirate ship. And then a corset <laughs> when you're trying to fight. <laughs> so it is said that she wore men's clothes and she went into battle when she was fighting. She would whip out a single boob. To um, show the man that he was bested by a woman. That is fantastic. And <laughs> isn't it? Just what one is... hacha. <laughs> yeah. Just before I kill you, look at this. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's also heard this as well is that in battle she would purposely also wear super loose fitting shirts that would expose her breasts completely. Nice distraction. Exactly. <laughs> it would distract the men, not only to be like, that's a woman, also, those are titties. Right. <laughs> uh, so she was able to fight them. I so mean, pirates are known for fighting dirty, so, so yeah, she fair was, enough. Uh, <laughs> true. <laughs> so she was she was just a badass pirate, basically. Um, then at some point during all of her little escapades at this point, she uh, got pregnant. They went to Cuba. She had the baby. So... Oh. What happened to the baby? Yeah, no one knows. <laughs> okay. Nobody knows. <laughs> so um, they didn't just have a little pirate toddler toddling around this, on board? <laughs> he was scrubbing the deck. <laughs> Pouring the rum. <laughs> <laughs> nope. <laughs> they don't know. In fact, uh, so some of the websites said that like she had family in Cuba, or he had family in Cuba, Calico Jack. That's convenient. Um, yeah, I don't think that's... Um, so they went to go back to pirating. Now, this is where the next pirate lady enters the story. There's another pirate lady. There's another pirate lady. (laughs) (laughs) No, she actually entered their, um, crew disguised as a man as well. Now, her name is Mary Reed, but she was going as Mark. Because, fun fact, that was her brother's, older brother's name, who died when they were young. So when, when she was young, she just started going off by Mark. And she started dressing like a boy. She started acting like a boy. She was just as, like... Probably just in bad temper as Anne. All right. <laughs> Seems like a match made in heaven. So she got onto the crew because they apprehended probably the ship she was on. And they basically said, hey, you could join our crew or we'll kill you. Or you could just jump off the ship and go fuck yourself. So she joined their crew. <laughs> and Anne immediately took a very liking into quote unquote Mark. She was like flirting with them. She was like, who's this new handsome cute man on board? Oh. She was like and She was in for a surprise. Yeah. So she went <laughs> up to Mark and was like, hey, wink wink, you know, I'm a woman and was like, look at my titties. Because that was the only way you knew if I was a woman. <laughs> I mean, what other way is there to tell? Um and then <laughs> and then Mark was like, What bitch me too? <laughs> And she's like, my real name is Mary. And they became what historians would say, 
very close friends. Oh, they were gal pals. Yeah, they were just gal pals. Just, yes. just friends. Just friends. Just, just the close, the bosom buddies. <laughs> And definitely not love. No, no, no. Gay people didn't exist no. until very no. recently. Yes, gay people weren't real in history. If you ask ninety percent of historians. But if you ask Captain Jack, he was so jealous over their relationship. He actually burst into the cabin with a knife, intent to slash Mary's throat. Jeez. To be like, stay away from man. She's mine. <laughs> and then Mary was like, Oh, but I'm a woman. I am a woman. <laughs> oh, I'm not coming on me. Uh, no. What? We're just gal pals. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Jack was nice. He backed off and then he was like, okay, I'll keep your secret. I think it eventually the whole crew knew that they were both women, but like, they, both, they dressed as men the whole time, so it didn't really matter to you know, like, Right. And if... You know, if Mary was anything like Anne, then they were both sufficient pirates. Why did gender matter to the pirates? Exactly. So much so that actually, now you bring that up, they were actually known, these two women, as the fierce Hellcats for their ferocious and aggressive tempers. And they were very ruthless when it came to battling. Um, And together, the three of them infiltrated many English ships and fighting, stealing cargo again. Um, And they were badasses together. They were very, they, th- those two women were like, ride or die. Like, they were like, go hard or go home. Right. They were a very fierce pirate thruple. Yes. <laughs> so they finally eventually ended up stealing a ship. This one, a new one called the William. And they assembled a new crew. And again, they were doing really good stuff where they started making a name for themselves. Which again, if you remember, if you were making a name for yourself, it means... That's when it got dangerous. Yes. Because you were stealing from the British, and they didn't like that. Because you could steal from anybody else, they didn't care. But not the British. Right. Yeah. Um, so, in fact, actually, their names appeared in the, a newspaper for, uh, in the Most Wanted Pirates in, fun fact, the Boston Newsletter. Oh, local. Yeah. By the way, we're from, we were from Mount Boston. <laughs> Outside of Boston. Obviously, I already said I was a Salem tour guide, so. Um, so, yeah, their name was in the newspaper. Um, they became so famous um, that basically the, the authorities couldn't let it go on any longer. So they actually sent out a famous pirate hunter, Jonathan Barnett. Now, he was an ex-pirate himself as well, and then eventually he became a commander in the British Navy. Now, what's with all these ex-pirates going on to being like, the other guy became a governor, this one became a British Navy commander? Yeah, I mean, I can't say that men in power are all always great men, so it's not all that surprising that they had bad histories, and the king was like, hey, you guys seem pretty powerful. I'll pay you to work for me instead. And they were like, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you don't have to. Okay. Plus, again, you know, what the king doesn't know that won't hurt him. Mm. So just because they're working for the king doesn't mean they aren't mm. still doing shifty sure. stuff on the side. Uh, all right. So on November 15th, 1720, the William was then overthrown by Jonathan Barnett. So apparently it was actually really easy to overthrow this crew, which usually it wasn't. Um, but this time it was, was because the whole crew was drunk, celebrating their recent plunder of a Spanish vessel. Now, none of the crew fought back. They surrendered very quickly. Jack actually was the one that surrendered. And they all hid below the decks. Wow, that's e- pretty brutal. Except for... And Bonnie and Mary Reed, of course. <laughs> they the fierce Hellcats. Yep. They were like, we're not going down without a fight. So they bravely fought and they kept fighting. And at this point, though, Anne was so mad that no other man on board were fighting that she stopped mid-fight to yell down to the below the decks. And this is what she said. I quote, if there's a man among ye, you'll come up and fight like the man you are ought to be. And then, when no one answered her, she fired a shot into the hold, killing one of her own crewmates. <laughs> yeah. Damn. She was like, fuck you. Yeah. Yeah. She's a bad bitch. That's impressive. Yeah. So, again, it was a short fight because it was only Anne and uh, Mary fighting. So the whole crew was apprehended and then sailed to Jamaica for trial. Now, this got into the... 
local newspapers and got the word got out that, you know, there was going to be a trial. But more importantly, there were two pirate ladies on board. So this became a sensation, became very popular. Right. I mean, women can do more than stay at home. What? Women can <laughs> be pirates? What? She, they can sail? They can Mind fight? Mind-blowing. Ah. So they actually tried the men separately from the women. Okay. Because. Of course they did. Yeah. The whole male crew was sentenced to execution by hanging. And Jack's last request was to see Anne. And do you know what, Katie, you know what happened? Was it a beautiful, heartwarming reunion? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so this quote is what she said to, to Captain Jack. This is the last thing she said to him. And a, this is her most famous quote. Had you fought like a man, you need not have been hung like a dog. Oof. So, not exactly the smoochy, heartwarming reunion he was hoping for. Nope. <laughs> so then Anne and Mary were, were tried, um, and they had one witness that really testified against them. Her name was Dorothy Thomas. Uh, this, apparently, Anne and Mary stole her canoe. <laughs> and then when they found out that Dorothy was going to testify against her, they threatened to kill her. Oh. And then, but but they were dressed as men, but Dorothy was like, the reason of me knowing and believing them to be women was by the largeness of their breasts. <laughs> Maybe they uh, should have hit them that time. <laughs> <laughs> so unfortunately, both women were found guilty and sentenced to hang. But both women pleaded with their bellies. What, is, what does that mean? So this, that means it was basically an English law, basically saying that if you were pregnant, you would... Oh. Be, you wouldn't be hanged right away. You'd wait out your pregnancy, and then you were hanged. Okay, um, gotta so save they, those babies. Yep, so they both claim to be pregnant. Those um, little pirate babies. Now, I don't know how, how you would prove you're pregnant back then, besides, like, showing. Yeah, I imagine you'd probably wait, and if, you know, you make it four or five months without any sort of, like, growth then, you know, like, you're, you're probably assumed to be lying. So, here's what happened. Mary and Reed ended up dying in prison of a fever in 1721. And now it is speculated it was due to complications of the childbirth. That would make sense. I can't imagine giving birth in a pirate prison was very hygienic. <laughs> but fun here. Anne's fate is unknown. Wait, what? <laughs> unknown. Oh, it's, there was no records of her release from prison or her ex execution. The one thing they do know is that she was not executed. Huh. So we have some theories of what happened to Anne. So what are the theories? So one says um, that due to her connections, um, sorry, not to her connections, her father came in to save the day, of course. Because it was so sensationalized. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, and because of his connections, he was able to get her released, uh, probably pay paid some type of ransom, and then moved her back to South Carolina where she then remarried, had eight kids, and died peacefully. What? Yep. Another theory is that she escaped from prison. Now, there's two different things. She either either settled down in the Caribbeans, where she kind of, like, continued piracy. Okay. Or she moved back to England, where she just owned a tavern, where she would spend the rest of her days telling tales of her piracy. <laughs> I like that theory best so far. I do too. And I think in my head, that's what happened to Anne. <laughs> so the last theory is that her father negotiated her release and instead married her off to a Jamaican official where she hmm. st then started going um, by Annabelle because there was records of a woman named Annabelle, but not Anne at this time, where she again had eight kids for some reason the eight kids kept popping up <laughs> um, and she lived the rest of her days. She apparently died when she was like 80 years old it so. seems outrageous to me that Anne bonnie the pirate queen would settle down and have eight kids yeah right i just can't imagine that I, even I, if even if it was her father that got her out of prison i can't imagine that she would have stayed where he put her yeah no no i just i'm i'm going to picture her in a tavern in london telling drunks about her her wild escapades maybe she's the captain that wrote the pirate journals. Ooh. 
Ooh. Ooh. I like that theory. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, they they have no proof. They have absolutely no proof of what happened to her. So that it's only theories. is quite possibly the best way for the Pirate Queen to end her story, though, is just, right? who knows? It's a mystery. <laughs> we snuck. <laughs> she left a good legacy. Her and Anne, actually, there's a statue of both of them, which is now stands in Burr Island in the Bahamas. That's so pretty neat. We can post that on the Instagram, too. We it's a cute statue. Will. Actually, Anne's um, boobies out on it. Lovely, Lit as is. she would have liked. That, right? That's what she <laughs> wanted. She serves as many inspirations in different novels, movies, TV shows, and video games. Um, you can play her in Assassin's Creed, or maybe not play her. She was just featured in Assassin's Creed 4, Black Flag. She is a playable character in Fate slash Grand Order. She is portrayed in the TV show Black Sails as Anne Bonny. Uh, now, Mary's also in Black Sails, but not till the very last episode, I guess, like, because it, it ended and, like, she met Mary. I was like, gotcha. They weren't ready for Gal Pals. <laughs> There's a song called The Ballad of Mary Reed and Anne Bonny. Lovely. Um, and that's it. Yeah, that's the legend of Anne Bonny. A bad bitch, if I ever did hear one. I have to agree. <laughs> yeah. Um, although I do think it's very fun, some of the similarities in our stories, that they both started off. Born to, you know, pretty well-off families, a duke and a lawyer. Um, Interesting Um, that... They both eloped. They both eloped. Um, It's interesting, though, that my... That Mary's father didn't really care about educating her, and Anne's father dressed her as a boy so he could Could educate educate her. her. (laughs) Um, And then instead, your woman was like, I want to learn, and Anne was like, I don't want to fucking learn. But they both took to traveling. Yeah, well, true. Yeah. Mary did a lot of writing and learned about inoculations. And, and Anne did a lot of stabbing. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> it's also pretty neat that Mary had a friend named Anne. Anne and, and Anne, Anne had, had a, a friend, friend named, named Mary. Mary. <laughs> um, anyways, but yeah, no, it wasn't. I, I loved I loved both their stories. Yeah, very they were very interesting and. In different ways. Yes, and. Especially for being in the time that they were, they kind of took it upon themselves to be extraordinary. Yes. And they made that happen through whatever means they necessary. They did what they wanted to do. Yes. 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 Because Mary was, she, she like, uh, how would you describe it? Like, she was very um, bullheaded. She decided to you know travel with her husband to the ottoman empire she decided that when her kids were grown she was done with her husband (laughs) that's my favorite (laughs) um yes they both yeah and took some great steps to get what they wanted out of life yeah instead of being what we discussed in the beginning of the episode which is a lot of women were you know you told you were told what to do by your father and then then given to a husband where you had to do that do what your husband said yeah yes. and because yeah. if you didn't again you, you might be a witch so you might be a witch you might be crazy um you might just be a complete disgrace yeah i'm surprised no one called your mary a witch for her yes yes or you know sent her to an asylum for having thoughts, thoughts. <laughs> Thought. what? what wait katie what <laughs> women can't think um yeah i think that wraps up most our episode though um yeah for now we'll be putting out an episode on wednesday every other week oh for women crush wednesday oh yeah yeah get it yeah (laughs) yes um Um, until we get more people listening other than our families and friends of course not that we don't appreciate you all immensely love you mom and dad (laughs) love you mom and z and aunties (laughs) Um, all right, so you can follow us um, on Twitter and Instagram at G B B B podcast. That's that's G three B's and podcast. G B B B podcast. G B B B B. No, just three B's. <laughs> or you can join our Facebook group, um, Good Bitch Bad Bitch Podcast. Yes, you can also email us any questions, comments, or suggestions for future bitches at goodbebadbpodcast at gmail.com and if you're listening to on on itunes please leave us a good review um and we yeah so we thank you again for listening and this was um are you a good bitch 
or a bad bitch. Cutting dink. I'm gonna. We're gonna add music at the end. Oh, like, yeah. Cue, cue sparkly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Bye, everyone. Are you a good witch or a bad witch? Bad witch. Bad bad bad. bad. Are you a good Are witch? You a good witch or a bad witch? Me? I'm not a. Are you a good witch?